So um, I'm really interested in one of the treatments I know is your favorite is one of the hardest results to get, which is the M-shaped lip. So I'd love to hear a little bit about how you define an M-shaped lip, but also um, what was it like for you when you first started treating this tricky type of lip and, and your journey to now and why you like it so much. You are so right, they are very tricky. And the M-shaped lip is, you know, we have three tubicles in the upper lip. One in the center, one on each side, followed by a flatter area towards the oral commissure. In an M-shaped patient, they usually have more volume in their central tubicle and then less volume in their lateral tubicles, which means that they, the upper lip gets the shape of an M. So when they are closing their lips gently, often they have two holes so you can see straight into their teeth because the central tubicle is touching the lower lip. So that is like the M-shaped lip. Mm -hmm. What's important to mention is that some patients, they, they like their M-shaped lip, which is amazing. But I have a high demand of patients that would like to correct this. And since the demand was so high, especially amongst the demographics of my patients, I felt, okay, I have a mission to solve. And I love a good challenge. So I started trying to think, and of course, you know, to, to come up with new techniques, we have to experiment. So I experimented a lot uh, under safe circumstances. I did some trial and errors, <laughs> learning by doing mistakes. So sometimes I had to dissolve because it didn't look good. Um, so we dissolved and we start over. And that's the way, you know, the journey, how I eventually, let's call it, crack the code, how to correct these M-shaped lips. So it was lots and lots of practice. Sometimes it did go wrong, okay, don't do that again, dissolve. So trial and error, learning by doing mistakes, and you see what works. Ah, I'm on the right track, and I continue, you know, developing that strategy until eventually, yes, I found the perfect technique to correct the M shape. So it was a journey. I didn't just M shape, took me two weeks, okay, I nailed it, no. It was a journey. And since I do, I work with precision and I'm very careful, safety first always. And in the beginning, I, I asked my friends and, and family members that have M-shaped lips. So those were the people that I experimented most on, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but then, yeah, that's how I learned to come to that, uh, to develop that technique. So yes, today M-shape is my favorite lip to treat, not just because my techni technique gives very um, natural and also sustainable results, but the gratitude from that patient, the reward I get from that is just mind-blowing. That's amazing because if you have a patient that you give some, you know, some patient, you give them the mirror and they get the happy tears. The M shape patients often get those happy tears and that's a huge reward for me. So mm -hmm. that is also a reason why I just love injecting M shapes. So that was quite interesting how you described your journey to solving it, because I think a lot of people think that you should just know the answer or not or not try it, which is obviously, I mean, that's not been my experience either. A, a lot of stuff is, you, you, ha, you come up with a working theory and you implement it and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And actually it's in those moments that you're actually learning. Exactly. And all the rest is just repeating stuff that you're probably quite simple that you already know. But the, um, that idea of, I will basically be brave enough to, to do a small experiment where you can manage the risks, but mm -hmm. you, you discover the limits. Mm -hmm. is, is that something you've done a lot is that is that a part of how you basically developed absolutely and I'm still doing it I mean I will never ever stop being a, a student I will try to get better and develop my techniques improve my techniques 
for as long as I'm working in this industry. I believe the day you believe you, you're perfect, you, you know it all, that's the day when you stop growing, even maybe shrinking, in my opinion. Mm. So I do it all the time, and I have been collaborating with anatomists, and I'm included in a lip compart compartment study at the moment. So I really, really are interested and know a lot about the anatomy of the lips, the small, small anatomical delicate structures such as the thin fascias, finding that close compartment of the lip. So ver work and collaborate together with anatomists uh, have really also helped me develop and improve my techniques. Tell me about what you think is going on. You know when you're injecting a lip and you, I call them paradoxical indentation, you inject but it seems to pull in. Mm -hmm. What, what's your theory about what's causing that? Oh, that happens all the time, doesn't it? So what we do have, we have connective tissue that is attached to the surface of the skin. So if you go, often that happens when you go a little bit deeper in the mid layer of the lip, just, just in front of the orbicularis oris muscle, or maybe just right in the very, very superficial part of the orbicularis oris muscle. If you inject in that compartment, that connective tissue that is attached to the surface of the skin will pull inwards because the filler just you create volume there. Sometimes you get those indentations because of the connective tissue. I mean, and I struggled with that with the beginning. And I tried, I mean, tried to fan between those, I call it hills and valleys for my patients. You know, I try to have an easy language for them to, to understand. And also on my trainings, I like to use easy language, you know. So, and then one day I just, what if I just squeeze the lip a bit, you know, give some pressure to the filler, press it towards the surface. So one day I just, okay, let's try this. So I got that deep indentation and I just squeezed the lip and va va poof, 3D projection. Mm -hmm. So that's how I treat those indentations. And yeah. I sometimes say um, that there's a, it's like 40 to 50% of your procedure is sometimes what happens after you've injected with your supporting hand. So that's an example of that. Do you, what's your philosophy on uh, on massaging, injecting, how much are you doing or do you try and get it all right with a needle before you and, and, and leave it that way? So I don't massage and press and mold the lips too much during the treatment. So again, I work with very, very much precision and I'm a slow injector. I don't have a rush at all. I like to, to use my time. Um, slow, slow precision and I try to mold as little as possible. So I'm injecting in a very specific pattern, in a very specific layer of the lip. So if I were to squeeze and massage like this, I would like more or less destroy that specific pattern that I'm injecting in. And also the more, more you mold and squeeze the lip during the treatment, the more they will swell because it's irritating the tissue and if you're gonna, you know, if you wanna show your work out to the people, showing before and after pictures, they get more swollen and puffy if you are there molding and massaging too much. So I try to, like you said, do what I can with the needle. And if everything is nice and smooth, I always feel carefully. Do I feel any lump or bump? No, then I don't mold. Mm -hmm. Do I have that little indentation? Okay, I give it a little squeeze. Okay, that helped. If I see a little nodule on the surface of the lip, I use what I call the scratch molding. Uh, so I usually use products for lips that are tissue integrative, so not too firm products that doesn't integrate in the tissue because I want it to look natural. I like to use flexible fillers that moves with the animation for natural expression. And these types of filler, if you get a visible nodule on the surface during the treatment, I use my fingernail. I know it sounds gross, but we are sanitized, we are wearing gloves. I just scratch with my nail 
like this on the surface and that little nodule will blend into the tissue. So that's mainly what I do. Not firm squeeze or massaging, I mainly do that scratch molding and if I feel a bump, a little nice pressure, but I try to avoid massaging too much. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, that fits with my understanding as well. I think I often see new injectors, as they, it's like they've been told to massage and they, they impose it and then they see what the result is. Whereas I think with experience, you, you start with feeling. It's the sensitivity first, and yes. then you make a decision about how much pressure you need. I, I like that's a good, a good tip. And then I also tell my patients, don't touch your lips for three days. I mean, of course they can touch them, but don't massage them because they have a local inflammation, of course, because of the trauma of the, of the needlework, uh, of the injection. So let the lips, let the swelling go down first. Because if they start, you know, massaging too early, the healing time will increase because you keep the inflammation going by irritating the tissue. So I always tell them, wait three to four days, just let them settle. And if you see any nodule or feel any lump or bump, then you do this or this. And I have recorded a video where I'm doing the scratch molding and the, the squeezing for deeper uh, lumps if they're, they are, you know, annoyed by them. So they can watch the video. We send them out to all my lip patients. They watch the video and then they do it at home. And actually after I did that, I think I haven't got a single patient coming back needing help with removing lumps and bumps, which can happen to anyone. Yeah, I mean, we've just before, as we were having a little break, um, discussing your work schedule. And um, that, that always intrigues me because you're obviously super successful, um, but you, you haven't lost your drive. You're still, what, what's, what's driving you? What do you think is? Yeah, what's driving me? Um, the thing is, I was born with some kind of a fire inside of me. I was born with an ambition. I have no idea where it comes from. No one in my family history have ever went to college, for example. No ambitions, you know, in a way. So I have no idea. It's just inside of me. And since I found this passion in the aesthetic industry, and I have my own story, my experience about the lips, and I really work hard, and I just love what I do. I mean, it's almost like, this sounds maybe a little bit like a cliche, but my work is my hobby. When you love what you do, when you have this passion, you, you get that extra you know, energy. And I had a discussion with your wife, Miranda, about this. And, and she said, yeah, isn't it like that? If you put that extra one or even up to 10%, depending on your life situation, just that little extra effort into your business, you will grow. So that's my mindset. Just push it just that little bit extra. And if you have the passion, the love for what you do, and when you get that, you know, reward back from your patients, that's what's keeping me going. And I'm going and I'm going and I'm going. Sometimes I'm going too hard. I don't listen to my body symptoms because I simply want to get in goal. So sometimes like now you hear I have a little bit of an infection going on. Uh, so I can get sick, so that's something I still have to learn to take a little bit better care of myself, to really balance life work, because that's important. It is important to be able to have a long and sustainable career. But it's the passion, the fire and the ambition in me that drives me forward. Thank you so much, Julie Hahn, for joining me. I really appreciate your time. Um, you're working flat out and you've given this time for us as well, so I'm very, very grateful. Thank you. No, I'm so honored. Thank you so much, Tim. Yeah.